Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's session. Uh, for those of you that are joining us live, uh, we'd welcome any engagement uh, and any questions that you want to ask. So to do so, uh, on your Zoom platform, you will see the tab that's highlighted in red. Use the Q&A button that will pull up the pop-out box. Type any questions that you may have, and you could choose to send it anonymously if you prefer. It will come through to us, and following the presentation, we will answer as many questions that we can as fully as we can. Uh, my name is Adam. I'm from the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Swans University. To give you a bit of introduction uh, and information, first of all, if you're not familiar with Swansea, uh, we're a city that's located on the south coast of Wales in the UK. It's a fairly small city with a population of 250,000 people. And the university itself uh, is right in the heart of the city. Um, so we were founded 100 years ago. Um, we started off as a small university with just one campus, which is on the bottom image of your screen, and since then have evolved and grown. Uh, and about five years ago, we opened the Bay Campus, which is the top image on screen, which is where our engineering subjects are based, uh, as well as the business school, some science departments uh, and student accommodation. The university has uh, around 23,000 students. Uh, we're very proud of many accolades that we have, um, one of which is to be ranked sixth in the UK for student satisfaction, uh, according to the NSS of 2020. Within engineering itself, we have four research themes, uh, digital and computational, health, well-being and sport, water and energy, and materials and manufacturing. And through these themes, we have many centres, groups and projects all working uh, towards these, uh, these themes. For our research, uh, we're ranked 10th in the UK, uh, according to the most recent UK uh, Research Excellence Framework, which was conducted in 2014. Um, and our research environment is ranked second in the UK for engineering. We collaborate with a lot of companies and organisations. Um, these are on research. Uh, they provide placements and internships and are employers um, to our students, as well as producing and funding many projects. This is just a small sample on screen uh, and is a range there of multinational to small companies across a range of sectors. We have many taught uh, undergraduate programs at BEng and BSc level, uh, as you can see on screen there. Our taught postgraduate portfolio is very wide ranging. Um, you can see that our list of available programs uh, on screen there. Today's session would be more pertinent, I think it's fair to say, to our power engineering uh, programs. Um, relevant subjects also include electronic and electrical engineering, but you can see um, many others that are available there as well. In terms of our engineering portfolio, all of our courses are ranked in the top 15 in the UK, uh, according to the Times Good University Guide of 2020. We're a top 10 graduate level um, employability ranking in the UK. 97% uh, of our engineering graduates are employed or in further study within six months of graduating. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce today um, our speaker is Dr. Augustine Igwebe. Dr. Igwebe is a lecturer in electronic and electrical engineering, and he's going to be delivering today's presentation on the digitization of the power grid network. So thanks for joining us, Augustine. Thank you very much, um, Adam. And I'll hand over to you. It's all yours. Thank you. And... Um, <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Um, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Um, and I hope you are keeping safe and well um, in what is a strange time all over the world with the, with the pandemic. Um, personally, myself, I'm so much passionate about uh, research. So whenever I have the opportunity to talk about some of the work that I do, um, some of the work that we do here at Swans University, it's always a pleasure to talk about it, reason because um, like 
Adam mentioned, we are um, a research-led university. And perhaps you're probably thinking you want to do a first degree, you want to do a master's. Uh, what has research got to do with that? Well, research is vital, reason because um, if you are part of a research-led university, it means that the, the lecturers, the, the, the professors, the doctors that will be teaching you, um, they are quite abreast with modern um, trend, modern um, engineering, and this in turn reflects on the content that you are taught on day in, day out. Um, it also means that with a research active university, you have access to world leading facilities, uh, which of course will help to prepare you uh, for your future career. Um, so today I'll be talking about um, the Power Grid Network, uh, which is part of some of the research we're doing here. And as it regards to uh, digitalization of, of the Power Grid and some of the work that we are doing at Swansea University in collaboration with um, our ind industrial our partners. In terms of a rough, uh, breakdown of um, the talk this evening. Um, first, I will say a bit about um, about myself, um, what I do, um, a bit of my history. And Adam, I think I saw on um, Adam's slide about Swansea. Um, I've been in Swansea for quite a while. I'll be saying a bit more about that. And then talking about the um, energy network itself and some of the current uh, current trends. And that will introduce you to some of the projects that is um, ongoing. And then to look at our program in a bit more details and the environment at which we study some of the facilities that are easily accessible to our students. And I will conclude by trying to point out some of the opportunities that um, even the challenges in engineering or the, the, the current trends um, in all those trends and, and problems lies opportunities opportunities for those who are already in the field, opportunities for um, future uh, prospects of, of students or graduates or graduates um, who want to have a career in the, in the area of either electrical electronics or in electrical uh, power systems or, or sustainable energy. So there are huge opportunities out there. And finally, there will be opportunity for us to, uh, to discuss. So just, um, just a bit about, about myself, about what, what I do. Um, I've been in Swansea for 10 years plus now. Um, it seems like yesterday when I decided to study um, abroad, I did my first degree at Swansea University. Um, I went on to um, complete my PhD here. My PhD was in power systems and power electronics. Um, I was um, lucky to be a recipient of a funding from the college of engineering at that time, um, in addition to some other fundings that came from uh, the EPS ROC. Um, since completing my PhD, uh, I've been an academic teaching staff here with uh, the College of Engineering, and my area of specialties is in the area of control systems, uh, power systems. Now, some of the research I do uh, on a day to day basis is in the area of, of control and, and power systems, and this field of Endeavor has grown so much over the years uh, that there's a lot to admire, um, even as engineering continues to take pace and move uh, consistently in providing uh, solutions uh, for the betterment of, of society. Um, in terms of research, see a bit about me. Um, I, I said I specialize in power systems, but if you want to delve a bit deeper, um, most of my current research is in the area of looking at how we actually implement uh, large scale renewables uh, with existing microgrids. And these include things like solar, uh, wind. And if we look at things like hybrid energy uh, conversion networks, for example, how we develop um, energy management system, whether you're looking at things like DC, uh, things like AC network, be it in a large scale or even in a small scale, like um, a, a distributed network. Um, so there is a lot of research that I currently do um, in addition to my PhD student um, in, this, in this area. Uh, there are a few pan partnerships in, in recent times that um, the most recent is with, um, with, with China, um, with our colleague in, in China, 
uh, where we're looking at how we, we uh, monitor and, and predict the behavior of energy co uh, consumption as it relates to the demand side management of, of uh, power network. Um, my current PhD student is doing um, a project that is looking into um, coordinated energy management for integration of renewables. And this is a project that is funded by the Qatar government. And again, we have a collaboration with um, the Qatar University. There are colleagues who are working together, getting real-time data from Qatar and developing software algorithm on how we can predict future behavior of not just the renewable energy sources, but even behavior of, of, of consumers. Um, like I mentioned, at the minute I have one PhD student, which I'm a first supervisor, and there are other four PhD students who I'm looking after in the capacity of um, uh, second, second supervisor. So it is exciting. Uh, you can tell that um, my portfolio is quite busy, um, but we are excited, myself and my colleagues, that we have opportunity to actually uh, perform real-time research in this uh, field of electrical electronics and um, power system engineering. So as far as today's talk is concerned, uh, looking at um, the digitization of the power grid network, I thought I'd start by just looking at the new normal. Especially with the pandemic, there's a lot in the news about the new normal. Uh, but what is the new normal when it comes to technological trends? What is the new normal uh, when it comes to um, energy, when it comes to technology? Um, even as I'm talking, I'm using mobile phones, I'm using technology. Uh, we now have technologies like drones. I mean, uh, for example, Amazon in recent times have used drones to deliver uh, packages to customers. Uh, we now have smart homes, for example, if you look at the picture in your, uh, your, your bottom left, for example, we now have smart homes. It's not just having microwaves or oven in the home, but we now have even fridge and microwaves and ovens in the home that are, can actually communicate and interact with digital technology. You can easily use your mobile phone, for example, to regulate the temperature of your fridge. You can use your mobile phone to, to regulate the, the, the illuminance of the, of the light in, in your house. You walk into a room and there are sensors that can sense your presence and bring the light on. And using this sort of technology, you can actually um, not just save energy, but make the home even more smarter. So if, for example, on a day you, you, you're rushing out of the house and you forgot to switch off your appliances, where you can easily do that, either you log on a web browser, or if you have an app on your mobile phone that you can easily regulate most of the smart devices in your home. It's so exciting because NAM engineering continues to evolve. We now have innovations like electric vehicles, plug-in electric vehicles. And for those who are looking at the news, for example, uh, Tesla has gone big on this, where there are massive strides in uh, getting um, energy vehicles, renewable energy vehicles, plug-in, whether it is hybrid or is solely, purely um, based on um, renewable energy or based on, on, on battery. Uh, but in addition to that as well, it is now even the, 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 the new horizon of artificial intelligence. Uh, which is which is exciting because with artificial intelligence it opens a new world of endeavor for us as engineers. Uh, for example, in my in my house I have uh, an Amazon Echo, um, Alexa. You can tell Alexa to switch on the light. You can use Alexa even to assess your um, TV, to assess even the programs in your TV. For example, you can use artificial intelligence to open up programs like YouTube's on on your computer. So this is all very exciting because it means that we have new opportunities at, at our disposal, which happens to be a new normal. And every one of us, um, either we are using some form of mobile phone technology, some form of uh, iPad, some form of tablets. For example, most of my lectures, I, I have an iPad, and most of my lecture is delivered using a tablet as opposed to uh, the classical way of using writing on a paper or writing on a whiteboard. So the technology has evolved so much. And in this involvement of the technology comes huge opportunity. And I think um, uh, Bill Gates, um, actually captured this in, in, um, in 2017, uh, where he said that if I were starting out today and looking for the same kind of opportunity to make a big impact in the world, he said he will consider three key fields or sectors. One is artificial intelligence, the second one is energy, 
and the last one is biosciences. And the beauty about it is this engineering fields can, there is this now level of intermultidiscipline, this level of interaction. Uh, in other words, it's not just looking at energy now, but how can we in, um, interlink artificial intelligence with energy? How can we have a bit of machine learning, for example? Can we predict the behavior of, of, of consumers of energy um, in that way, trying to tailor energy to meet uh, the human needs. So this opens a, a, a world of opportunities and of course a world of challenges to us as um, academic researchers and even to industries and even to consumers of energy, for example, because everybody wants things that are more smart, everybody wants devices that are more adaptive and at the same time you want to save money, you want to get more value for the money that you give to energy companies, for example. So this is all new horizon and it opened up, like I said, a new world of opportunity, the new normal. But let's not forget that as the world is concerned, there is the old normal. And the old normal really is that we have an energy crisis. In one hand, it's the conventional energy system, it's coming from fossil fuel. And fossil fuel comes carbon footprint. And with fossil fuel comes the, the pollution of the atmosphere. With fossil fuel, it makes the environment unsustainable. And you probably have seen a lot in the news where most government all over the world, there is a commitment to reduce the carbon, carbon footprint. So for example, the UK government has have the, have set the hard target of a net zero carbon emission by 2050. And as of last year, the prime minister announced that by 2030, for example, there will be no sales of new, uh, new uh, petrol cars or diesel cars or hybrid cars. So no, 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 there's a ban on those sectors to make sure that the carbon footprint within the UK is reduced. And I know there are governments all over the world and politicians who are working so hard to make sure that we can keep the environment safe. We can reduce uh, the pollution by burning fossil fuel. And, and in addition to that is the infrastructures that we currently have. The current power grid network is, is old. Some, some of these setups, I mean, even in the UK or even in developing countries, even Nigeria, where I am from, um, they, some of these are centuries old. And another challenge with these infrastructures is that they are designed in the classical way where energy is meant to move in one direction. The consumer of energy is not um, wasn't considered at the point of installation. And in addition to that, it's this one directional way of transmitting energy where you generate energy in one hub and you have to, um, you have to develop long transmission networks to send this energy from the point of generation uh, to the point of consumption. Again, it's a big challenge, it's an expensive way of, of transmitting energy. And in addition to that, it's, what renewables can help to solve. Um, most countries are now finding a way of bringing renewable energy like wind, like PV um, into the current uh, structure. But be that as it may, it is not optimized. Um, and for, for, for example, can we have a, 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 a scenario where we can have a high integration of renewable energy sources into our grid and the current structure of our network, the current setup of our network does not allow the large integration of renewables because we want to be able to operate our current network, just plug in um, new renewable systems into that, system, into that network and the system should be able to adapt and be able to uh, sustain itself. But fortunately, the current system is not, is not designed for that. So even though we're excited about the, the new normal, the, the massive advancement that we've experienced in, in various technological trends, there are these issues that many more that are still pertinent that as engineers, as scientists, we have to find some clever measures of, of solving. Um, of course, we want to save the planet. And at the same time, we want to bring satisfaction, value to the end user of, of energy. And to solve that, the, the, the current trend is looking into uh, this concept of smart grid. Um, basically, we've got our grid network, but how can we make it more smarter? How can we digitize it? It's not just having 
PV system, it's not just having wheat turbines, it's not just having this load. Can we have a way where this system can interact with one another? Can we have a way where we can break this autonomy of having large scale centralized power generators and have it more distributed? Can we move the generation of energy uh, closer to where it is consumed as opposed to generating uh, power at one end and then running this through some long uh, transmission line? And, and, and this gives us a, a bright, wonderful opportunity to explore. And there are lots of research and, and lots of interventions from major uh, stakeholders within the field of power uh, engineering, power the power industry, where the smart grid, not just looking at the, the electrical component of, of the grid, but looking at a, a more digitized uh, communication topology. And in the past, we've talked of things like um, the internet of things. And there is even now a, a new innovation looking at um, the internet of systems, what we call the industry uh, 4.0. Um, and, and with the industry 4.0, we now have in, uh, machines, for example, uh, communicating with the power generators like your wind turbine. You look at some industrial setups now, and it is optimized to a level where we now have drones, we now have robots replacing uh, mechanical uh, human effort and at the same time be able to optimize it in a way that the system one it is resilient two it is secure and at the same time it is sustainable and if you look at again from the consumer side we are now moving away from just having the consumer or the participants or those who buy or purchase energy are just mere consumers we are now moving towards um the consumer being a consumer and at the same time as producers, what we call the prosumers. In other words, you're not just um, producing energy, you, you're also consuming. You consume, you save energy for yourself because you're actually generating that. But at the same time, you can make money off it by selling it back to the grid. So again, that is a new world of opportunity for you as an, a, a consumer. And as a matter of fact, even here at Swansea University, most of our new generation buildings are part of this con, uh, prosumer initiatives where we build buildings now and we have PV panels and per perhaps wherever you are, you have one of these uh, PV panels or even small wind turbines that are, that are installed. And the point about the smart grid, the point about the industry 4.0, the point about looking at this concept of digitalization is making sure that when we have our official grids um, and there are lots of research work that is already ongoing, that there is advanced connectivity and in addition to that, there is automation. In other words, it is a seamless approach. And like I mentioned, um, with your mobile phones nowadays, you can, wherever you are remotely, you can regulate devices in your house, but we want, we want to do more. We want to be able to, even if we have clusters of PV panels, if we have clusters of, of wind turbines, we want to be able to automate them, want to be able to improve um, connectivity of this, of this hardware while improving as well uh, flexibility. And, and I mean, one could argue that digitalization and, and power supply go hand in Hand. One cannot do without the other. If we are to if we are to survive and 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 maintain and and have a growing economy, then we want um, consistent, reliable power supply. But it's not just reliable power supply, but we, we need an intelligent power supply. We need an intelligent power network that is able to self-sustain itself. A, a intelligent power network that is able to self-heal. For example, is a a well orchestrated power system that is um, able to protect itself from from cyber hacking, for example, there's a lot um, a, about the cyber hacking, um, cyber security. So again, there is a whole world of opportunity in there. And some of the research we do here uh, looks into how we can continue to build uh, power electronic um, interface, um, clever software 
uh, technology software so solution to address some of these some of these problems. And it's also good to know that some of the industrial partners, even in their sort of behavior, um, consumer behavior and industrial level, they're beginning to change, have a, a massive change of paradigm and having a more efficient and productive way of getting their processes run uh, and that way contributing towards reducing this issue of, of carbon uh, footprint and at the same time bringing value to the end user uh, in terms of reduction in, in the cost of in the cost of energy. And I thought this, this graph from the International Energy Agency actually uh, drive that point home. And if you look at the, the, the first graph on, on, your, on your left, you look at the, the sort of the global access rate to internet and electricity. And if you look at that, um, as of 2008, 2007, it is a massive gap in there. And But as of 2017, you can see that there are more and more people all over the world that are now getting more access to internet. There are more and more people who are, I mean, it's even more, the growth is even more pronounced in, in developing countries. And, and you, you can project that in a couple of years time, the, the, the slope of electricity and, and, and the internet says they're gonna merge and even overlap at some point. And, and the point here is, the more we are, uh, people are demanding or, or, or they requesting for energy usage or the more our demand or our request for energy is increasing, at the same time, people does just, doesn't just want um, energy, but they want energy that is smart. And we can find a way of, 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 of bringing these two requirements together. People need um, higher connectivity, want things to be smarter, but at the same time, you want the energy supply to be at that forefront, to be maintained over, uh, over a long run. And, and as a matter of fact, even you have things like your uh, home appliances, for example, you have even cars, for example, now that are not connected to the, to the network, uh, we now talk about things like um, vehicle to vehicle communication and this sort of same um, um, digitalization is applicable even in healthcare. I mean, now you have mobile phones that can uh, read the head condition of a person, you can measure your heart rate and the rest. We now use them for surveillance, for example, for intelligent transport system. And the point here is the world itself is moving at this pace and it's also important that be the provider of energy or be the regulator or be the facilitator of energy that we continue to develop system that, um, that adapt with the need of, of people in making sure that the usage and, and the interactivity of our energy system is well digitized so that it is seamless for consumers and end users uh, to, to assess. Now, let's look at some of the work we're doing here at uh, Swansea University. Uh, I've just done a, a very um, um, a selected F, um, few uh, projects that um, myself and some of my colleagues uh, we, 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 we're doing to um, address some of these challenges that I've, 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 I've um, highlighted in the, in the past. And at the same time to, to look at um, what we're doing currently to uh, to make sure that even this is um, we is embedded within what we do in 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 our course. Uh, the first figure there, which I, I identify, figure one. Um, Again, this is a project um, that's completed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Megda Fazeli, um, who is actually the, 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 the lead for our MSc program here at Swansea University. Um, again, here you're looking at this same concept of uh, future uh, network um, of the power grid. How, if, for example, in this case, you have things like PV, like batteries, uh, you have um, the conventional grid itself, how we can develop this sort of smart technology uh, to interact in a way that we can still transfer energy when it's available. Uh, we can still be able to track uh, the maximum energy. I notice my light has gone off. Okay. Yeah, sorry about that. My light, office light is gone off. Okay. So um, again, if we have things like batteries, how we can interface uh, this with um, 
the grid itself. So again, this is another uh, a very I think it's actually had a patent on 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 this work. Again, is a collaboration with uh, industrial partners. The, the figure two um, is a work completed by my colleague as well with um, partners from the United States looking at high voltage AC network, high voltage DC network. Again, looking at how we can have a sort of hybrid. So can we, as you probably know, most of the devices that we have in our domestic houses or in our day-to-day -day uses actually uses DC. Um, so can we have a, 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 a hybrid system where one is DC, one is, one is AC and have some clever uh, intelligent power electronic converters uh, that is able to manage the power quality of these of, of these um, two networks, and at the same time being able to optimize the energy flow uh, within this network. And really, the the core objective here is: can we make this sort of system? more smarter? Can we make them more reliable? Can we make them more secure? Can we make them more sustainable? And of course, for the consumer, it's about cost saving. How much money, how much value am I getting for assessing this energy, for assessing this network, or for assessing this system? Um, figure three, again, another work that was completed recently. Uh, here, we're looking at how we can predict um, the PV generation. So can we use historic data using the concept of machine learning, using the concept of neural network, using the concept of physiologic? Can we predict the behavior of PV generation even in a short term? Again, another fantastic work there that, that, that was done using the power of microprocessor, uh, the power of, um, of um, high level computing uh, to predict the behavior of, uh, of PV, PV generation. Uh, figure four is one of my, uh, my work that um, um, I completed um, as well. Uh, again, here we're looking at how we how various distributed generators uh, interact in terms of load sharing. Again, using the concept of digitalization, how we get um, a power electronic converter, but then using information sharing within that uh, power electronic converter. If you have them, for example, all in an array and you have multiple systems that are interfaced together, can we have a clever communication topology within them so that the energy generation is optimized? We know that with PV, the solar energy is not always there. For example, um, you can have a peak in the summer, depending on where you are. Um, and then somewhere in the winter, then you have limited um, access to, to solar energy. So again, can we optimize the, the peak uh, generation from PV panel when the energy is actually there, while at the same time minimizing how much dependence we have on um, auxiliary generators like a conventional uh, diesel, gen diesel generator. Uh, figure five is a work completed by my colleague, Dr. Uh, Zomfu. And as you can see there, that's one of our labs here at Swansea University, um, our power electronics power system laboratory. Um, again, this concept of digitalization um, when we have our hardware. And in this work is basically developing this sort of digital control system to track the maximum power from, from PV. And here we actually, it has actually built um, the hardware uh, interface. If you, on your screen there, you can actually, I have my mouse, you can see the power electronic converter there. And we have um, sort of a hardware in the loop where we write clever software algorithm. Um, a, we want to be able to extract the maximum power. And at the same time, want to manage the load that is interfaced uh, within this, um, this sort of uh, system. So again, all are fantastic work and they are all published in IEEE Explore. You can put any of these initials on IEEE Explore and you see as many uh, journals. Some of this work um, is already uh, pay, um, on a patent, uh, patent application that is currently under review. Again, fantastic one. Like I said, having this sort of novel research work here at our disposal means that our students have access to, to novel ideas, novel current trends and that can um, easily be embedded within the learning experience for each and every of our students. Um, again, in this concept of digitalization, um, making uh, buildings of tomorrow as power stations. So it's not just now having buildings, but can we have buildings that are able to actually 
uh, self generate energy are able to actually self store those energy and and have some again clever power electronics interface to manage the energy and this was uh, a project that's completed uh, is actually here this is one in our bay campus and um, the team in specific in collaboration with a company uh, tata uh, where uh, the materials within this building for example you got you have pv roof there but at the same time even the materials within this building um, is able to um, harness energy, um, even the, the heat energy is able to store, and it has uh, um, battery banks within that to hold those energy for 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 some time. Uh, there's a link there for you. I mean, on that website, you can see the building actually in in, in operation. Again, this is all um, a, a, again a testament to what we can do, and and I think the government has actually uh, funded um, a huge amount of future buildings even in here in Wales and the United Kingdom on making sure that buildings of tomorrow actually have this consideration of making them uh, self sustainers making buildings power generation again that is a world of, of opportunity that's a new world of opportunities for um, even early career researchers as well in trying to optimize and, and improve on this uh, latest trend in, in technology and majority of this project that I've mentioned um, has collaboration with, with, with industry and we collaborate a lot with our industrial partners. Um, again, we work a lot uh, with, with the national grid. Um, my colleague, Dr. Um, Gracia has worked a lot with, with General Electric, which is based in the United States. Um, Again, most of the things I'll be talking about is on um, on system level, but even in device level, we do a lot of, of work in terms of devices. So once we have this sort of system level architecture, we still need the power electronics interface. We still need the um, the, the fast switching devices. And um, uh, my colleague, which we actually next door, um, would doing a lot of projects with um, uh, Newport uh, with our lab, developing these devices. And this is a, a, a selection of um, few companies that we're currently working with um, of, of recent. And most of them are energy-based. There is a German company in there, again, doing a project uh, as it relates to uh, green energy, uh, green energy in, in interfacing, um, trying to bring this concept of distributed um, generation uh, to, the, to, the, to the front line, to making sure that the technologies of tomorrow, the technology that are actually used in the industry, they are, they are well tailored uh, to be digital so that the consumer can and have a, a easy access, not just to data, but the energy that is delivered, the energy that is used, it is sustainable, it is secure, uh, it, is, um, it is efficient. Um, yes, once the our learning environment, we call it, I always call it a dynamic learning environment and it's dynamic in the sense that it's always changing. And why is it changing? It's changing thanks to the research work that is going on. It's changing thanks to um, the, the, the clever engineering ingenuity uh, that is at work. And here, the, the building here, this is the Engineering East, which um, holds our power electronics power system laboratory. And you can see me there in one of the uh, test bed there. Uh, that is a, um, a PV test bed. Um, again, this concept of distributed generator, where you have a small cluster of a system that you can easily design. Um, there is a, a, a PV panel. You can actually play with the uh, regulation of the sun when it's not available. You can actually um, simulate that and actually emulate the behavior of the sun. And one of those new buildings that we have recently is the impact building as well. Again, this building, um, it's easier to, to foster um, academic and in industrial partnership, ensuring that this sort of cross-discipline approach, like um, Big Gates said, bringing this sort of artificial intelligence and um, an energy and other collaboration within the field of engineering into play. And for me, the beauty about it is that the engineering is so intra multidisciplinary that there is a bit of everything in everything that you do. And, and all across our university, there is a lot of collaborative work that is going on um, in developing new technology. And if you look at the next uh, slide there, you can see, for example, in the concept of machine as well, we do a lot on 
not just developing the soft solution, but actually using this self solution to, to powering machines. So for example, we have an industrial scale uh, system here with our DC motor. We build these power electronics interface controllers and, and then our students have access to this sort of real time a test in, in developing, again, you develop the ideas and you can actually test this idea in, um, in real time. Uh, you can move on to actually building the circuitry, like you probably see in this year, you can build the actual circuit. Uh, we have our uh, in-house uh, PCB manufacturing facilities here, where you can actually build this um, circuit, prototype it and actually test it in real time, again, to validate that conceptual design of whatever is it that you're doing within the power system network or across the electrical and electronics field. Uh, but like I mentioned as well, it's not just the power system, it's not just the, um, the renewables. Again, communication is at the heart of it. So uh, there's a lot about 5G network at the minute and we have our um, smart city and smart antenna laboratory, um, which is the two images you have in the, in the in the top here, uh, where we're actually looking at uh, mobile communication and exploring even this concept of, of 5G to make sure that uh, communication um, it is optimized, whether you're applying it for um, electrical network or you're applying it for any other uh, network within uh, within the field of Endeavor. The bottom image there, it's uh, we have, um, like I mentioned, we do a lot on devices as well, and we have our dedicated uh, nano printing centers where we actually print these devices, print, print uh, silicon wafer, um, and there's a lot happening um, with our industrial panels in, um, at, at Newport. So again, these technologies, these facilities are at your disposal as a, as a student here with us. And whether you're doing masters or you move on to do to do research work, you can have a direct access to these um, to these facilities. And of course, um, like I mentioned about machine learning, uh, machine learning is a big um, a, a big drive and there's a law we have our dedicated robotic lab as you probably see there again trying to um, emulate and actually uh, prototype this sort of machine learning initiative uh, within um, the engineering the engineering trend so there is a huge lot of opportunities in there and the environment like I said is always changing because as a research-led university we will always at the, the forefront of modern engineering trends and that is why if you look at our research history there are uh, projects, grants, publications that are coming from the university uh, almost every day because we are so actively involved in, uh, in research work, in looking for new ideas, uh, stretching the breadth and the, and, the, and, the, and the depth of science to make sure that we can explore every eventualities. I mean, a, a good testament is the, 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 the promptness of even having a vaccine, for example, is to tell you how much science can go if we, if we stretch that, that breadth and stretch those, those widths. Um, I've said a lot about digitization and the microgrid and the smart grid, but like I, I did allude to at the beginning of my presentation, for every of the challenges or for every of the trends or every of the old or new normal gives us opportunity. Um, perhaps you're thinking of a, a degree in electrical or a, a, a master's program in electrical or in, in power systems or in sustainability, there is a huge world of opportunities for, for us to explore, even myself included, because I continue to do research. So there is a new world of opportunity, whether it's in the plug-in electric vehicle. And for those that are looking at the news, for example, if you know the Chinese company Neo um, recently uh, came up with a crazy but brilliant idea about, about batteries, for example, and with their electric vehicles, uh, rather than moving to a, a charging station, you actually move to a charging station to replace your battery. So you go in there as a customer of this company, you get a new battery that is fully charged, and then you go within a couple of minutes, the, 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 the system is well digitized and configured that you take out the old battery that is run, that has run down and then gives you a new battery. Again, a new words of, of, of possibility. Um, Opportunities could also include, like I mentioned, some of the research I'm doing is in the area of large scale implementation of renewable energy. Um, energy storage is a, is a big, big, big uh, talk, especially when it comes to how we integrate renewable energy. So again, that uh, opens up another new world of opportunities on um, energy storage, especially if it relates to, to solar. Um, 
there is so much again happening within the demand side management and some of the projects I'm doing with my uh, colleague in, in China is looking at how the consumer can become an active participant Peters in the energy um, market or in this um, energy world that, that we have, making the uh, consumer, which again is you and I, how we can be actively participate in what's happening in our energy needs. Can we have some technology that can predict our behavior, can predict the amount of energy that we'll need in the future? Can we predict, for example, how um, a, a company uh, is energy management? Can we use historic data, for example, to predict the behavior of future uh, energy, um, energy usage? So again, this opened up huge worlds of opportunity. We still need engineers and researchers to look into ways of how we can optimally monitor the use of energy, how we can actually operate this technology if, when we do install them. We do need clever technology to analyze the data I mean, we are in the we are in this big data conundrum where uh, big big data is everything. I mean, even using your mobile phones, there are a huge amount of data that is generated every day. Can we find a way when it comes to energy? Can we look at the historical uh, strand of our power uh, network and use that to 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 find some optimum way of operating our network? Um, what happened, for example, when some of these technologies break down? Do we have a restoration mechanism, for example? Um, we've seen news actually mostly common in the developing countries where you have a blackout, for example. So again, that opened up a, a world of opportunity. What about maximum power point tracking? Uh, I mentioned some of the projects we're doing here is looking at the maximum power point tracking of, of energy. Again, we need some clever technology to, to track um, energy. And, and finally, optimization. And optimization is key, actually, when it comes to uh, the, 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 the end user, because when energy is well optimized, it means that the customer can get value for money. Uh, there will be the energy will, will be will, will be available at a rate that is that is convenient and accessible to the user. So again, can we optimize this? And the point here is a digitized network, a well configured digitized network. We offer choices to the end user choices to even those that are involved in the energy market. And that choice is what the old normal doesn't have or the old way or the old power network doesn't have. The old power network basically operates in a sort of more autonomous way of delivering energy, but with microgrid, with smart grid, with uh, digitization, the end user, we can now have a say in the energy that we use, the energy that we have access to. And not just having a say in it, we can then use our day-to-day -day devices like your tablet, your computer to assess that energy. The truth of the matter is a consumer or somebody that is non-engineering probably don't understand Faraday's law. But if you own your mobile phone and you see your usage as a data or as a percentage, then you can easily relate with that. So again, a huge world of, of opportunities for us. And um, if you think, you know, the market, the power engineering um, field is oversaturated, I, I mean, I, I want to respectfully decline to say that, no, uh, there is a huge world of opportunities here and you can set up a career in any of these areas that I've highlighted. And there are so many startup companies that are kicking off every day um, in providing solution um, to, to um, to cater for this uh, for these needs. Uh, just in conclusion, as um, there are, I can summarize today's talk into three Ds. Uh, first is this concept of the old normal, which is decarbonization. We've um, we've the carbon footprint, and we, we we keep harming the environment by burning fossil fuel. Um, so the first key for us, the first challenge for us is, can we move towards uh, low uh, carbon um, energy sources? Can we move towards renewables? Can we um, move away from um, um, carbon uh, emission? Uh, in addition to that, can we decentralize? Can we move towards distributed generators? Can we um, actually generate the energy at the point where it is required as opposed to actually generating it in a long distance away and the 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 the, the, the final crop there which for me really is a heartbeat of this discussion is digitalization can we bring some intelligence to this uh, topology can we make our 
future uh, energy technologies and solutions? Can we make our inf infrastructures more flexible? Can we make them more adaptive? Can we make them more smart so that the, the user of the energy or the user of the technology can have a better interaction, not just end user as a consumer at home, but even in the industry, in the industrial partners, can we have more software solution, more communication that is, um, that is faster enough um, for it to deliver the, the, the end objective. And just to summarize this with the words of uh, the famous um, Thomas Edison, and this is one of my uh, favorite quotes. My students probably know me with this quote. Uh, and he said this, uh, he said, if we all did the things that we are capable of doing, he said, we would literally have stunned ourselves. And I think that is true. There's so much we can do. There's so much you can contribute um, in, um, providing solution to some of these um, trends or problems that I've highlighted. And yeah, Swansea University, we are well positioned. Um, we have the resources, we have the personnel, we have the facility to prepare you and, and provide you with the necessary skills. And at the same time to set you in motion uh, in creating engineering solution that uh, will be of help to, to the society. So really, uh, the future in the energy system is bright. Uh, the future of digitalization, the huge challenges, but new challenges that with more research, with more endurance in, 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 in looking into the research and providing solution, we can make a huge difference uh, for our world uh, and for human needs, okay? So thank you so much. And I want to believe that you will have um, some, uh, some questions. Thank you, Augustine, for that really informative and enjoyable uh, presentation. Um, there's a few questions coming already uh, live, and while we're waiting for some more, um, I want to ask you one. Um, as much as we'd wanted to, uh, you know, the digitization of a power grid network isn't going to happen overnight, um, and we can't simply replace in whole one network for another. Now, when we are integrating new technologies and principles with, you know, old existing ones. Um, and to make them compatible, what are the key things that, that, that we would need to consider and, and mitigate against? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. And I think um, there are probably thousands or not billions of researchers and engineers who are actually um, debating and, and thinking on the same problem. And as a matter of fact, some of the research work that I actually highlighted is looking into that. Uh, because what, the first thing you have to consider as well, that even while you try to replace the, the, the old with the new, there are still some basic infrastructures that you have to make sure that um, energy um, supply is, is, is conserved. So for example, you talk about hospitals, they are even military centers, for example, mm -hmm. you talk about big data centers, you want to make sure that even while you in integrate these renewable energies that make sure that it is done in a way that it's, it's seamless without causing huge disruption. Okay, so and I think that is why the, the, the concept of having Prototypes. So when you look at big energy companies like uh, GE, like National Grid, mm -hmm. you have you have this sort of uh, bespoke um, a set of project where you start with a little cluster of community, even a campus, for example, um, and then gradually you you expand this into a network. And 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 just to be more specific to your question, uh, that is why it's actually called distributed, um, in the sense that you can have a self-sustaining network that can cater for um, a given amount of consumer load. Um, of course, it has to adhere to all the regulations um, from the, the, the government, the regulation from the, um, the IETs and all the professional bodies that regulate. But I think one of the criteria in all these distributed generators or distributed systems or mini microgrids, I mean, in some cases, we have um, uh, micro microgrids. Uh, for example, I think in China, there is a concept of the micro microgrid is make sure that it, it had dealt to the, 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 the strict requirement that you are able to connect two systems together without any disruption. So I think that is, that is, a, that is a key. Um, in addition to that as well, most of the current system is gonna start with hybrid. So it's not a case where you wake up overnight and you get rid of all your um, your 
steam turbines or your your nuclear power stations no it's going to be it's going to be hybrid uh, but i think it's more of moving rather than trying to eliminate the generators it's more of moving the load so you you can look at it as this is my global network or the global conventional classic system that for example supplies 20 communities and then you start to build this new network um now the microgrid can you move one community at a time so as opposed to moving all 10 communities into this new uh, this new power network. So there is a lot of consideration in there. And that is why it's a dilemma reason because there is a lot that as researchers, we must, we must do. But there is one thing that is a common denominator in here is that if we continue in the old way of doing things, our environment, our world will be unlivable. Perhaps we have to move to Mars or move to Mercury. So whether we said, people say, oh, it's impossible to have all renewables. But at the same time, if we continue to pump pollution into the air, carbon monoxide into the air, our, I mean, we're already having global warming. Our society become unbearable for us. So there is need for us to start taking conscious daily efforts to make sure that we can minimize, um, we can minimize um, uh, global warming and reduce our, our carbon footprint. Um, we've just had a question. Um, apart from using conventional sources, so you know, linked with what you're saying, um, why don't we work on using hydrogen for our energy requirements? I know it's not your area of expertise. Are you familiar? I know we are doing some work with hydrogen here at Swansea, and I know to what extent are you aware uh, of that, Augustine? Yeah, I mean, again, I've um, I've highlighted if if you of um, if you of those sources of I mean renewable energy. Uh, but even within the university, uh, I mean, your, your slide has a huge uh, research, research centers. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we do a lot again with, um, with marine energy, for example. So there's a lot of research going, going on in there. Uh, there are um, um, research centers within university looking into things like, uh, things like hydro. Um, of course, when you look at these sort of renewable technologies, what you'll be looking at as well it's the availability of the renewable source. So when I'm talking about renewable source now, you're looking at, for example, in the case of solar, um, the availability of, 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 of sunlight, for example, solar irradiance, we call it, or wind technology. In the case of hydro, uh, the availability of, of hydro energy. And then you now go down to the point of the cost of the infrastructure. So this, this is also key, the cost of the infrastructure. So for example, um, it's probably much cheaper to set up a PV panel on top of your roof as opposed to you as a end user trying to set up a hydro um, hydro generating plant. Yeah, but just to answer the question in a bit more detail, yes, it is possible. But what you find is when it comes to renewable energy integration, you're not going to just have just one renewable energy source. It's going to be um, an hybrid of, of sources. And as a matter of fact, some of the research work we're doing actually look at what happens when you have things like PV, for example, you have things like wind, you have things like even marine energy. Are you, remember, the technology, the concept is still the same. You want to be able to harness as much energy from these sources and be able to control it and deliver to the end user without a causing any disruption to the to the grid. And by the same time, you want to preserve the quality um, of the energy. And we're talking about quality of energy. Now we're talking about things like we want the frequency to be well regulated. We want the magnitude of the voltage to be regulated. You don't want to be sitting in your house. And you probably noticed now when I was sitting in the office and the light went off. Now that is just the switch just. Uh, being inactive, but when you have a light that become intermittent and start flickering or fluctuating, again that is no good. So again, the digitalization concept is still is still the same. It's still the same uh, uh, bedrock, even if you have different sorts of energy being interfaced together. Good. Um, it's a question from Aminu, who has rightly assumed that you are Nigerian, um, and has, <laughs> has uh, <laughs> he's commented that. Um, the power generated um, conventionally is inadequate to feed um, the needs of Nigeria. So like what I, what I would address that as is um, what barriers are there in other countries such as Nigeria to adopting technology such as this or implementing technology such as this and principles? Yeah, I mean, I, I can. Um, I said Aminu, yes, yes, I can. Yeah. I can. Yeah, I can easily relate with that because I grew I grew up in Nigeria, I think. Um, 
uh, I've been here what 10, 10 years plus. Yeah. Um, again, just to answer it in twofold, we do have the the natural resources in terms of the the solar energy, in terms of the wind. There are mm -hmm. regions in Nigeria where you have massive wind, for example. There are places in Nigeria where you have these resources. And as a matter of fact, in my slide. I did mention my collaboration with a, a, a small company in Nigeria, looking at how we can actually use locally sourced um, um, materials to produce PV panels within Nigeria. So again, there are lots of these projects uh, going on, uh, but again, just to link it back to the, to the previous question, it is a case that this is not something that will happen overnight, uh, but when you look at other countries, most times it is more political as well. Uh, because you have to have the right legislation in place to um, adopt this energy. And I know in Nigeria, we are heavily dependent on oil. We're heavily de dependent on hydrocarbon, for example. And so you will need some of these big companies to start having a, a, a paradigm shift and making sure that even in their operations, uh, I mean, some of the statistics, when you see some of the statistics, the major um, air pollution or so global warming or carbon footprint comes from human behavior, the cars that we are driving, for example, the cost that it takes to produce even a bar of chocolate, for example, this is all contributing towards that carbon, uh, carbon footprint. So as, as the case of Nigeria, again, it's most of the government, like the United States, I mentioned United Kingdom, for example, it has to be a firm legislation to say, as a country, like the UK, for example, said, by 2050, we are going towards net zero. By 2030, no new sales of no sales of new petrol or diesel cars, for example. So again, it has to be a combined uh, legislative effort. But at the same time, as well, from what I've discussed, you as a consumer, so as a citizen of the country, you can decide to say, okay, I want to at least have some of my energy uh, requirement from PV and have locally installed PV in in your uh, in your in your roof. Spot on in that, you know, it's, it's happened very privately at the moment, isn't it? Because that's all that can be done until it is adopted from a policy perspective. And yeah, globally, and, and even in the UK, there are legit, there are um, incentives that encourages people, even though at times you, the rate of return may take a couple of years. But again, that is a government having some incentive to say, hey, we have to you have to play part. Yeah, you have to play part. And even apart from having PV on top of your roof, you can't decide to control your energy usage as well. So remember, if you are in a country where the energy is coming off from hydrocarbon or it's coming from fossil uh, fuel, then you can't decide to regulate. I know in Nigeria, the power supply is not consistent. You can't decide to minimize. I know there are some people who leave their light on for, for 24 hours, for example. So it is, you can't decide to have a sort of a, a change in behavior to say, you know what, I'm going to reduce my energy consumption. Because remember, for every light bulb that you put on, for every time you use electricity, again, that is somewhere, somewhere, there is um, pollution going into the air that is contributing towards the, the global warming. So individually, you have to um, have a commitment to want it to, to, to turn towards renewables, but collectively as a country, as a, as a government, there have to be policies in place uh, to promote that. And even in the UK, there are lots of grants, there are lots of projects within industries uh, to make sure that we have, even at worst case scenario, have a prototype. So I can relate with Nigeria. You can't decide to say, you go into a state and you say, okay, let's pick a community within that state and let's have a prototype of a system that is purely renewable or that is hybrid, that has a bit of diesel generators or a bit uh, from the national grid, but 70% or 50% of the energy consumption comes from renewables. Thank you. Um, so Mia and Salim have each asked um, a fairly similar question around um, student projects. Uh, can you give some examples of student involvement in, um, in research and industrial projects at Swans University? Um, how does this enhance the knowledge and sort of employability skills of our students? I mean, this is um, this is a very um, again another good another good question, and and I mean talking about project, I have just recently actually uh, defined a project that I submitted on on the on the system. Um, I mean, project it's um, I've been involved with um, academia for of. Um, since my PhD for, for a while now, and I've, I've supervised a whole lot of students, and I did mention um, 
the current PhD is actually a project that was defined with the Qatar government in looking at, again, this um, issue of renewables. But for students, there are basically three ways you can get a project. Um, the primary the primary route for a project is because we work a lot with the industry. Most times what we do is trying to solve industrial problems. So some of the, the selected companies that I showed. So for example, you have Tata, you have um, the National Grid, for example. I, I think last year we have some student actually developing some engineering solution to solve a problem that was actually um, uh, a company was experiencing. So usually when the industrial partners have a, an engineering problem, because we discuss with them a lot, we interact with them a lot, we can't define a project to based on that um, industrial, technical, real-time challenge, and the student can actually work on that in the, in the lifespan of that project. Uh, another route through which our students can actually get a project, uh, like I did mention, as academics, we are research active. So for example, I do a lot of research in renewables, a lot of research in microgrids. And when I define project, I define project based on what I'm researching on. And so for example, I've just defined a project today that is looking at hybrid energy network using machine learning. Yeah, coincidentally using machine learning. So students who have interest in that area can actually pick a project um, so again, not just myself, but my colleagues uh, specialize in different areas, uh, devices, communication, um, even high level power electronics. So again, they define project and there will be a database of project. Um, but what I can assure you as well, because we are so research active, it is difficult to have an archaic project in that list because those projects are coming from latest ideas, latest uh, research work. But there is a third option through which the students can have a project. Students can actually define their own project. And I think that is important. And in the past, I've had students walk into the office and say, I have an idea around microgrid. Can I experiment and do a project um, in XYZ? And you, you sit down with that student and then we can actually draft, draft the project. And what we normally call the self-defined project. And as a college, we've actually adopted that where students have the opportunity to actually define their own project. And what that means therefore is that even before you come to university or before you decide to study an MSc, you've always had an idea in mind. And I, I, I understand, for example, perhaps you, you finished your first degree in Nigeria and you did a project and you're saying, okay, if I have the opportunity, I want to study abroad, but I want to improve on this project. I want to build on it. So that is the opportunity for you to actually self-define. And what the college would do is to, is to match your idea with the academics who is specialties in that area. And then you can come up with a realistic scope within that project and work on that during the lifetime of your project. Fantastic, right. That's all we've got um, time for tonight, Augustine. Um, I just want to set a little reminder for everybody. Um, if you do want to follow up, uh, ask any further questions um, of myself or Augustine about any study or research uh, in this field or any other engineering fields. My contact details uh, are on your screen there. Please do get in touch uh, and Dr. Aguebe and I would be happy to help you. If you want to make a note uh, of those contact details, please do so. Okay, Dr. Gregory, thank you so much, Augustine, for your, your time this evening, but also for all of your work and your insights. That was uh, really enjoyable. I'm sure all of our audience found it uh, interesting as well. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, thank you for your time. I can see some questions in the Q&A, but I think we'll, Adam will try and answer those um, offline. I think there are some questions about if you require program, uh, programming for Triple E. Um, no, you don't, because we'll teach you all that here. Yeah. Okay. Pretty much it. Yeah, yeah. Anything specialist and specific, you know, there is no um, no prerequisite really. Um, you know, the, the key prerequisite, uh, Augustine, as you know, is is, is a fundamental uh, knowledge of key mathematic mathematics, uh, really, and that's that's the only thing that we would really scrutinise uh, to a certain scale. Yeah, yeah. But we, we we try we try to support our students as much as possible. It's a journey, and as academics, we we learn together. It's a collaborative effort, and that is why our students have gone on to do so so well, even even in the in the industry. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much, Augustine. I really appreciate that. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>